Try to bunch up a little bit. Got a little room on this side. <clears throat> we all thank you again for coming, and we are doing, taking every opportunity to, to keep the people of South Carolina informed. Call on Chaplain Jason Strong to open the meeting, please. Thank you very much, yes, Governor. Sir. I invite you all to pray or to not pray according to your convictions, or to join with me as I offer a prayer. My Lord, you are my comfort amidst uncertainty because you possess the power to calm the storms. You are unchanging. Pour out your divine love upon us now, just as you have done in the past. Manifest it in our national, state, and local leadership, and also the various agency experts as they make plans, analyze data, and, propo and propose innovative solutions to our complex problems. Manifest it in us as a people, as our lives are disrupted. Cause us to be a patient, nimble, flexible, cooperative people, and above all, to support each other, remembering that we are our brother's keepers. Calm our storm and grant us peace. May this present adversity be the stage upon which all that is good and excellent about the people of South Carolina be displayed. When this pestilence is ended, may we too be judged as having been unchanged in our commitment to love first. I humbly ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain. We're Thank glad you, to have with us Josie mm -hmm. McDaniel Burkett signing and also Holly May to assist as well. We thank you for being here. <clears throat> I'm in issuing an executive order which will provide as follows. This is an executive order. These are mandatory requirements. These are not requests. I'm requiring the state agencies to waive any regulation they need to waive in order to address more quickly the requirements of the coronavirus crisis. That is, any regulation so we can move more nimbly, faster, without delay. I'm requiring the Department of Revenue to extend the state tax deadlines for all state taxes. They are delayed until June the 1st. That is to file and to pay all state taxes, and that includes income taxes, business taxes, sales taxes for small as well as large businesses, admissions taxes, motor fuel taxes, and any tax I've left out. The idea behind this is to allow these businesses to have a maintain their cash flow during this crisis in order that they may be able to pay their employees. Now those rules are a little bit different from the federal rules, but uh, the Department of Revenue has a website with details and so does the, the federal <coughs> uh, revenue service. Restaurants and bars, now this is a requirement, restaurants and bars must close their dine-in service starting tomorrow. That is, tomorrow morning, no more dine-in service. It is allowed and, and recommended that takeout curbside delivery of food to homes, businesses, takeout, all of that be increased and enhanced wherever possible. This decision was made in concert with conversations with a number of people, including uh, John Durst, who is the director of the South Carolina Restaurant Association and Chairman Bobby Williams. And we've talked to a lot of people. We know this is a dislocation. We know a lot of these things are going to cause problems for businesses, but the, the enemy we face, this enemy of this virus, is bigger than any sort of irritation or inconvenience that any of us could have. So we are asking people to stick together and understand that we're in a crisis and we need to take these measures. I'm also ordering, I'm prohibiting organized events of 50 or more people to be held in any state, county, city, or publicly owned facility. I'm requiring the National Guard 
to begin coordinating and planning with the hospitals for mobile facilities uh, to build infrastructure to require re acquire resources. This is a plan. We're not doing this, but we're making plans. Our, our goal is to stay ahead, to think ahead, and to stop this virus. Also, <clears throat> DHEC will ra waive regulations so hospitals can use medical and nursing school students to help in their operations. Now, those that I've mentioned are requirements. Those are mandates that will be included in my executive order. I'm also requesting some things, not requiring, but recommending and requesting things. That is, that South Carolina Medical and Surgical Centers halt all elective and non-threatening surgical and medical procedures within the next 72 hours. Why is that? That will allow for medicines, equipment, space, things like masks and all those sorts of equipment and personnel to be used by the hospitals to treat the, those who come into the hospital with this, with this virus and they'll have room and have capacity to do that. I'm also asking, I'm requesting South Carolina insurance companies to pay, to pay 100% of the costs associated with a coronavirus doctor's office visit. That is, we want those visits to be free for the patients. This will means that there will be, it, no, no payment will be required for things like x-rays, tests, and pr procedures that are done in connection with testing and determining the presence of the, corona, the COVID-19 virus. South Carolina insurance companies are requested, are requested to incentivize doctors to treat patients with non-COVID-19 issues by telehealth rather than in person. That is, if it can be done by telehealth, oh, if it can be done without a, an in-person visit, do that. That will allow space for those who do need to come in for appointments for the uh, COVID-19 patients. I'm also asking, requesting grocery stores like Costco, Walmart, Target, and all the rest to limit customer purchases for things like paper products, disinfectants, water, and those kind of things. We're experiencing right now where people are rushing in and buying way more than they need, and that is limiting the supplies for other people who have none. So, ladies and gentlemen, people of South Carolina, be, be courteous, be smart. We don't need to hoard all of these supplies. Let your neighbors have access to them as well. I also would like to recommend, as they've done in some places, uh, to have senior hours for people, for our seniors to come into these stores so that they are not in the presence of all the, the rest of the customers who would be there. That will give our seniors the, the comfort in coming in without worrying about the catching the virus because as you know it is the seniors and the older people, particularly those with underlying chronic conditions that are most vulnerable and susceptible. And also I'm asking every private employer in South Carolina, asking every private employer in our state to allow workers to work remotely if they are not 100% essential to the operation of the business. We've already done this for all the state government offices and we're asking the private employers to do that as well. So if they not don't need to be there, if it's not absolutely necessary for them to be there, let them work remotely as much as you can, and that will help us control this virus. Now I'd like to call on Superintendent Spear. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Governor. Since the Governor made his announcement Sunday afternoon that all schools in South Carolina would be closed, um, there have been lots of things happening. One superintendent called me today and said, the reason I like to be in education is because I can give my folks an impossible task and they can do it very well. And I know that's not just true of education, but all of our service providers, our emergency folks, our medical folks. So I thank you to all of them, but especially the teachers, principals, superintendents, volunteers who have been coming in to help us. We have sent out instruction packets all across the state. Students are working on those. Our e-learning process is working very well. Yesterday and today, 
Uh, we have approved over 600 feeding sites across South Carolina using a thousand plus buses to deliver meals to those students who could not come or drive by. To see where those feeding sites are, you can go on the website of your local district or the State Department of Education's website, which is ed.sc.gov, ed.sc.gov. Our partner, South Carolina ETV, announced today that on Tuesday, March the 26th, they will change their programming from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. It will be filled with instructional programming, content area programming for all age levels. I'd say to parents though, right now, you can use ETV particularly in the mornings for your youngsters, your young learners, and there are some times there uh, where content material is given, but that will be extended beginning March 26. And parents, one of the things that uh, I would like to ask you to do is to take some time and really just talk with your, particularly your young learners. They're not on social media, so they're at home now and they may not understand all of what's happening, a lot of stress, and I know it's stressful on you as well. We have posted on our website, ed.sc.gov, some tips that have been given by the American uh, Society of Psychologists. I think they're very, very good, and I'd ask you to take time to speak with your children about this. It's very frightening, but we can get through this together. People are stepping up to the plate. And finally, I did send a letter today to the U.S. Department of Education asking for a waiver on our federal mandated testing. I anticipate hearing back from them. Other states are following in that, and we will keep you posted. But we're also at the governor's direction looking at all of our regulations, and we will be asking for relief of those that we need to use to um, meet the needs of this pandemic and to really support our families and students in the proper way. So thank you, Governor. Thank you, Ms. Fillman. Dr. Linda Bell, Department of Health and Environmental Control. Yes. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Um, as an update, DHEC is now reporting a total of 47 cases of COVID-19 in 13 counties across our state. This includes four from Beaufort, three from Charleston, one from Calhoun, 22 from Kershaw, two from Lancaster, one from Fairfield, three from Lexington, one from Richland, one from York, one from Spartanburg, two from Anderson, two from Greenville, and four from Horry County. Sadly, this includes our state's first reported death of a patient who recently had been reported to having been diagnosed with COVID-19. The patient was an elderly person from Lexington County and was a resident of Lexington Medical Center Extended Care Skilled Nursing Facility. The patient had underlying health issues prior to testing positive for COVID-19. Because of these underlying medical conditions, we do not know the exact cause of death. We reported on the patient's death yesterday. We are continuing to work with the facility to identify all contacts and are providing guidance about infection control measures to prevent possible spread. While we have been expecting a day in which we would have to make this announcement, it's never easy to have to report on the death of a fellow member of our community. On behalf of all South Carolinians, we want to express our deepest sympathy for the family and loved ones of this patient. This loss is a reminder of the importance of taking precautions to protect those at higher risk, like the elderly and people with serious underlying health conditions from exposure to illness. As South Carolina's lead public health authority, our top priorities remain preventing the spread of disease and protecting the public's health. As of late yesterday, DHEC's public health laboratory has conducted 456 tests, 47 are positive and 409 are negative. This did not conclude the negative tests performed by other reference labs. We know that many South Carolinians are concerned about what impact the virus may have on themselves, their loved ones, and on our state. We are currently only seeing ongoing transmission 
in one county, Kershaw County. We want people to be prepared and to remain calm and rational as more cases occur. Recognize that the majority of illnesses are relatively mild, the type of illness for which individuals may not normally even seek medical care. Based on what we know so far, the CDC expects that many people in the United States will at some point, either this year or next year, potentially be exposed to the COVID-19 virus. This will include residents here in South Carolina. However, it's important to note that most people will likely not develop serious illness. While this is occurring as we expected it to, we still must continue to take measures to help safeguard against illness, including practicing good hygiene, like frequently washing hands, and we mean thoroughly washing hands for 20 seconds. This is just a visual um, between the fingers with soap and water. Every time you touch a surface when you've been in public or your hands are potentially contaminated. That's one of the most important measures in preventing the spread of disease. We also remind people to cover your cough to prevent the spread of respiratory droplets. Individuals with signs of illness are asked to take seriously the recommendation to stay home from school and work and not attend public gatherings. We do not recommend that everyone who is ill get a test to see if they have been diagnosed or if they have COVID-19. And if disease activity increases significantly, we will advise people to stay home, get better, and seek medical care if symptoms are worsening. This will allow our health care system and our health care providers to give care to those who need it most. This will likely be an extended response. Please know that our public health professionals are constantly monitoring our epidemiologic data and following CDC guidance and recommendations for strategies to slow the spread of disease in our communities. As cases increase, we are prioritizing identifying the close contacts who are at high risk of illness to those who are known to be infected and are more likely to suffer serious illness. This includes our nursing homes and assisted living facilities, as well as other vulnerable populations with unique circumstances. We, like other states, are also beginning to practice social distancing for communities as a whole. The number of cases that ultimately occur will depend in part on all of our efforts to practice good personal hygiene like hand washing and protecting others by staying home when ill. Please know that our public health professionals are constantly monitoring our epidemiologic data and following CDC guidance and recommendations for strategies to slow the spread of this disease in our communities. We also continue to work with federal, state, and local partners to prepare and respond to this situation to best protect the health of the residents of South Carolina. And I would like to thank all of our public health professionals who have been working around the clock diligently since we first recognized spread in the United States. They are investigating reported cases, they're following up on the contacts of known cases, and educating the public on steps they can take to help prevent the safety and health of our state. And I'd also like to help uh, to thank our health care providers who are working compassionately to meet this significant increase in the demand for care. We are still learning about this virus and we are committed to keeping the public informed. As we learn more, we will continue to provide updates as quickly and as timely as possible. For the latest information, I encourage you to visit our website at scdhec.gov forward slash COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bell. <clears throat> are there any questions? I have a question for Dr. Bell. I know you said uh, whoa, that. Wait a second. Dr. Bell? <laughs> <laughs> I know you said that things have moved the way you guys expected them to thus far. What are you all expecting now? Uh, what, what can we expect? And that is, that is difficult to predict. And it depends largely on how successful we are in implementing these community mitigation measures. And so, uh, and, uh, and con community containment measures. So that to the extent that individuals take very seriously our recommendations that they do not go in public while ill, and that they are very um, fastidious about hand washing, about personal hygiene, that can significantly impact the spread of disease and can slow the spread of disease. And so we can, it's difficult to predict 
but um, these additional measures we hope will slow the spread. Dr. Bell, um, is the newest Lexington County case also connected to the extended care facility? The newest, the, the newest Lexington County case that we were reporting was a known contact to a previously reported case. Can you be more specific than that? Uh, no. Governor? Yes, sir. We're hearing that a lobbyist at the State House has contracted the coronavirus. A lobbyist who was in the State House as late as last week. Are any special measures being taken at the State House because of this? So regardless of, of who becomes infected that comes to our attention, we recommend the same measures. We ask those who are um, diagnosed, if they can um, stay home, they can stay in self-isolation uh, self, uh, at home if they do not require medical care. We ask that their close contacts remain in quarantine for 14 days after the last contact with someone who is ill and to not go in public places to carefully monitor for the signs and symptoms of illness. So the measures are the same when, uh, for each new case that we identify. In public settings, uh, we, we do not seek to um, identify all individuals who are in a large public gathering because we don't consider all the individuals in a large public gathering to be exposed. So it is the close contacts of individuals that we focus on for specific disease measures. Excuse me for specific disease prevention measures. Governor. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Bell, can you say how many tests have been conducted uh, at this point, not just the number of tests that have come back and whether there might be a backlog? So DHEC is able to report on the total number of cases performed, both positive and negative. Private reference labs report positive reports to us. We don't know the number, the total number of tests performed by uh, private reference labs. Governor. Question. Right, Governor. What are you guys advising child care centers to do? And if you guys are advising anybody, should, what are you advising the workers in, that, in high risk categories to do as well? What we're advising uh, individuals in, in um, I think you're asking about high risk settings like child care, is yes. that correct? So we do consider um, certain facilities, certain situations to be higher risk because they are congregate settings. And, um, and so, for the example, in a child care setting, there are young children who don't practice good hygiene. They're in close contact with one another for many hours during the day. So we have specific recommendations for settings like that um, from everything from environmental cleaning, for monitoring for illness, we ask that um, if child care centers remain home, that they monitor and inform parents about uh, signs and symptoms of illness, that they not send their children to a child care setting if they have any signs of illness. And those are some specific measures that we take for settings like that. And those are still applying to workers in those child care centers as well? Uh, yes, actually they apply to all staff, to all assistants, to, to everyone connected with the facility. Dr. Bell, can you say if there has been additional spread at that Lexington County nursing home? Um, we had one report yesterday of an, a Lexington County case of an elderly person uh, who had contact. Now you're saying there's a third case in Lexington County. Any spread in that, in that nursing home? So I, I do not have details to report on on each individual case. But we do know that the first two cases reported from Lexington County were known contacts. As you expect this to spread, do we have enough ICU beds, respirators, and ventilators in the state of South Carolina? This is Dr. Toomey. So the question was, within the state of South Carolina, do we have enough ICU beds or ventilators? Um, it will depend upon the severity of the illness. I think the steps taken, although elective admissions and elective procedures being curtailed, will help the staff and be able to focus their care on the crit critically ill. Um, it's going to be a day by day. We monitor the hospitals every six hours for their census. So we've activated the reporting system for hospitals to give us their status on hospital beds. Do you know how many beds we actually have? I see beds. As of this morning at 10 o'clock, we were in the green category, so there was not a uh, a shortage in any one hospital that reported. Governor, would the National Guard be activated to build temporary medical facilities if hospitals are overcrowded? That is the purpose of the plan that we are 
developing. We've not gotten to that point, but we are doing all we can to stay ahead. So we are planning in a number of directions for a number of contingencies, and that is one of them, yes. Governor, I know that you said that you are uh, making some changes as far as restaurants and bars. At what point are we going to move from uh, recommendations of people not going out to curfews and mandates on that? Those, those are not recommendations. That is in the executive order that the bars, the restaurants and bars will close. But as the far dining as facilities, people, but, but not for takeout. As far as people going out and curfews, when will we, or will we see something like that? Like all, all such measures are, are options that are on the table. We do those things, implement those things as they become necessary. Governor, should lawmakers suspend session, in your opinion, the legislative session? They are. Today, the Senate passed the $45 million request for DHEC, and, we, and the, the House is coming in on Thursday and to do the same thing. That will give us $45 million in addition to what we're receiving from the federal government to, to make sure that we are, are strong in our, our defenses and the operations, particularly of DHEC and in the health care. But we're going to do everything we can to see that we have all of the resources available to do whatever is necessary to take care of people. Should they suspend the session? Uh, they, go, they are going to, to do that. They are, the House is on furlough, I believe. That, that will be up to them. But, of, of course, when they come back, they are limiting that to only the essential personnel. We need to do the business of the state, but we need to be very, very careful. Dr. Bell. Um, yes, sir. Dr. There, was a, there was a case reported out of a hospital in Georgetown. Is that the new case in Horry County? We're reporting cases by the county level, not by the facility. What about uh, funeral directors um, and bombers? Should they take special precaution caution when embalming bodies that are people who have died because of the virus? And then what about funeral homes? What is the legal liability for them having funerals if someone should come in to view a body or during that service and they're sick? Well, funeral directors like um, health care providers are uh, advised to always maintain universal precautions. So regardless of a known cause of death, they follow specific measures at all times when handling human remains. Um, with regards to funeral services, um, we would follow the same recommendations that we are making for all community gatherings to avoid non-essential um, gatherings, and so that would be left up to the, the personal preferences of families and communities on a case-by-case -case basis for special situations like that. Governor, if I could, I'd, like, I'd like to ask about grocery stores again, because this is a big deal out there with the public right now. These stores are swamped, overwhelmed with shoppers. I know you touched on it earlier, but what would you tell South Carolinians about going to the grocery store and how to act when they go inside. No, that, that would be for you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, could you repeat the question, please? Grocery stores are overwhelmed right now with shoppers, panic buying. Uh, so we were wondering, the governor touched on it earlier, what would the message be to South Carolinians going shopping in these grocery stores right now as, these, as the panic buying continues? Well, we're... we're um, providing as much information as we can to, to prevent people from panicking. We're asking people to remain calm, to behave rationally, to, to make purchases to meet their basic needs, their basic immediate needs. There's no, there's no need to stockpile resources. Uh, we do ask people to, to also behave responsibly in public if they're ill, have someone else get those groceries for them, use services for the delivery of groceries. So. There is no need to panic, and, uh, and so we're trying to reassure people to prevent behaviors that uh, have a ripple effect that uh, affect others in the community based on uh, unnecessary panic behaviors. Governor, your executive yes, order prohibits the large gatherings of 50-plus in publicly owned facilities that would include the State House. So <clears throat> does that mean the Senate, the House can't be in there if there's more than 50 people? No, so that, that, was, it, that was addressed in my last order, and it does not exclude that. More questions. Yes, ma'am. Can you go into DHEC's policy of retesting patients after that 14-day quarantine that have tested positive for the coronavirus? Do they, do they need to have two negative tests come back to not be in quarantine anymore? 
So the recommendations for retesting applies only to certain situations. For the vast majority of individuals, if they are in home isolation, we ask that they not return to work uh, until they are symptom free. For some individuals, they may require a, a test after symptoms resolve to show that they are no longer carrying the virus. That primarily applies to the situation like a healthcare provider or who works in some other um, high risk setting. Um, but we, we want to make absolutely clear because we're getting a lot of questions then, so you are testing people without symptoms and that is only to allow them to, to return to work. I want to strongly emphasize that we are otherwise not recommending testing individuals without symptoms to make decisions about whether they should come to work if they have not, if they're not yet ill. We're getting a lot of questions about should people be tested so that they can go to work? Should people be tested during the quarantine period? And the answer is no, because if you test in a quarantine period, you don't know if you've tested in the time frame to actually detect the virus. People without symptoms who have not been ill should not be tested. So right now it's not mandatory after someone's been in quarantine to be retested before leaving their house after 14 days after a positive result two weeks earlier? It, it depends on, on a case-by-case -case basis. If the, if the testing is being performed so that they can return to an essential duty like a health care provider. So for the vast majority, we are not recommending testing after someone, uh, we're not recommending any testing for people in quarantine, and we're not recommending testing after individuals have, uh, their illness has resolved. Dr. Bell, if you've tested positive and been cleared, and you go back to work, can you catch it again? Is it like a stomach virus or something that you could catch again, or? Well, there are a lot of things that we don't know yet about this virus. The possibility of reinfecting, reinfection with, this, with the same strain of this virus is not currently known, but that, you know, that doesn't mean that they can't catch something else, and it doesn't mean that people cannot be co-infected with two different viruses at the same time. Dr. Dr. Bell, are you, are you monitoring any cases in Dorchester County right now? There was a report that there may have been some exposure at a cement facility plant there. Some workers may have been exposed. So our uh, frontline epidemiologists are the ones who are investigating the, um, the, the contacts of high-risk exposures. And I don't have the information here with me. As the number of cases increase, um, the expectation that we'll be able to report on the number being monitored and in particular settings uh, will, will, will not be feasible because as cases increase, that the number surrounding those cases becomes unmanageable. Dr. Bell, how many tests do we have? What's our capacity? And when we look at that, uh, we heard from Kershaw Health CEO Sue uh, Shugart yesterday say that they're kind of running out of swabs to do these tests. Um, do we have the supplies to address that need? And, and what's that looking like at this time? Dr. Toomey? Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, supplies, we have sufficient supplies in our public health lab to complete tests. But there is a statewide, in, in not statewide, but in locales, swabs are getting to be in a shorter supply, as are other pieces of the protective, personal protective equipment. So yes, swabs, uh, we've gotten reports from different locations that they're running short on the swabs. And the swabs are very important. They're not um, Q-tips, <laughs> thank you. Uh, they are very specific uh, for the test, and so that's a critical part of the process. Uh, but we have enough supplies to run the tests at the DHEC Public Health Lab at this point in time. Swabs across the state in certain locations are running short. So how are they going to get those supplies? Is that from the stockpile? Uh, yes, that would be one. Uh, the Strategic National Stockpile, we have requested a disbursement of those. We have received the first delivery today. We are inventorying that delivery. We never know exactly what you get until you open up some of the uh, containers. Uh, and we will report on what we received. But it will be, I'm not sure if they're swabs, but it will have masks, gowns, uh, respirators, various parts of the PPE that it will be important to distribute. Dr. Bell, yes, and, uh, yes. teachers are getting paid. What about the front desk or the staff members in the school system and also workers in the private sector? I can answer the question regarding teachers. Yes, you're right. Teachers will be paid. The bus drivers, um, other support folks that are working in districts, those are district employees. 
and their funding is through their district. Uh, in talking with the superintendents across the state, I can tell you they're doing everything possible. Their intent is to keep those folks paid. Uh, we're bringing many of them in to work as usual, some not, but still the, the districts are hoping to keep all of those folks paid. But that is a local issue there. Any chance you'll extend the time that children have out of school? I know it's till the end of the month, but any chance you'll extend that? And then for the Chief Justice, what about our court systems? Are you going to um, end any of the court hearings? Can you well, as far as extending any closures, we'll make that decision as it gets closer and what the situation is at that time. Oh, oh, oh. Chief, Chief Justice. As to the court system, as we all know, a functional judicial branch is the cornerstone of any working democracy. And when there's a disruption, uh, disruption, I should say, of the judicial process, then that's a serious problem for us all. And we are encountering that right now. Yes, there will be a curtailment of hearings, especially those that require the large gathering of people, such as a jury pool, such as a roll call in General Sessions Court, such as a second, second appearance in a General Sessions Court. Those things will be curtailed if not, actually, we terminated those for the time being. And what we are doing now, in a nutshell, we are only holding necessary hearings, necessary emergency procedures, and most of those are surrounding criminal matters and the family court. And also, Governor, sort of the same question. For those working in the private sector, what's being done for them who cannot go to work or, you know, have any income? Danny Elsie, <coughs> Department of Workforce, and Workforce. So uh, many employers have paid sick leave, paid annual leave. Employees who are out sick, uh, quarantined, can draw on their company uh, policies for sick leave. Uh, some companies have paid FMLA um, as well. <clears throat> if an employee is out of work because he's been laid off, because his company shut down his facility, closed completely, cut his hours, then that employee can file for unemployment and will be eligible for um, unemployment in the state. Uh, the third possible avenue for an employee to receive income during the time they're out is the federal house bill that's been passed uh, that's in the Senate and they're attempted to work out a compromise, which does have a provision in there for two weeks of paid leave and certain payments for uh, extended FMLA or for FMLA payments. So there are a variety of known uh, sources of income from company policies uh, to unemployment. If they are laid off, if they're just out sick on their own, they're not going to be eligible for uh, uh, unemployment under our state laws. Uh, and then there's the possibility or not the great probability that this legislation will pass uh, in, the, uh, in Congress and there will be some relief for employees. Dr. Bell, um, you've, you have said that uh, doctors should first test for like flu and other respiratory respiratory illnesses before testing for COVID-19. How much do those tests cost? I, I, it can depend on your insurance provider and your coverage. Is I that also, uh, are you asking insurance companies to, uh, to cover those costs fully as well? Is that what you Yes. Do? Okay. Has DHEC's guidelines changed at all for who is recommended for testing? Because right now a few of the recommendations are international travel in the last 14 days, known contact with another person, or illnesses that can't be explained as anything else. Is there any other qualifications now, or has that been lowered at all to allow more people who are worried they might have come in contact with it through the community spread to be tested at this point? So, um, no. What we have communicated to providers is to stick as closely as possible to the criteria for the presence of symptoms, fever, cough, shortness of breath, a history of travel, and, um, but at the healthcare provider's discretion, it is up to them to, um, to make the final decision as to whether or not there is some gray area in terms of them meeting that criteria. And so it's the healthcare provider who is making the decision ultimately about testing. But we do want to encourage individuals not to seek testing unnecessarily. Dr. Bell, do we have any updates on the people that have been diagnosed with this virus? Are you guys keeping up with them? Do we know if they've recovered or 
there are situations that they're in stable condition, good condition, critical condition. What, what's it look like right now? So DHEC conducts surveillance for reports of illnesses. Once they're in the healthcare um, arena, we don't, we don't track their, um, their outcomes or their status. And in fact, that information is confidential. If you were to contact a healthcare facility and ask about an individual person's status, it, that is a violation to report on individuals' um, protected health information. Dr. Bell, I want to ask about waiving the regulations to allow the use of medical nursing students. A lot of these students have already gone home from their universities. What would be the uh, measures to use these students going forward? Um, I, I, I think that uh, if, if um, students are still in their health care training track, medical students and nursing students, uh, if they are in the years where they are actually in practicing in clinical settings, I believe that those are individuals because they have some health care training and they could, be, they could be used. Would they be paid or would this be like college credit? I would, if the hospitals utilize or decide to utilize students that ha meet a certain level of experience and criteria, I would expect that they would be compensated for that level. Um, now some students are part of that um, and they require a certain number of hours to accomplish their degree. And so there's a fine line in there, but I would say if you're transitioning from the educational environment to a work environment, I would expect them to be logically paid. Did we get any information on the case in Richmond County, whether that person was, where that person was employed or what sector? So as, as long as it's feasible to, to notify individuals who um, are diagnosed and to conduct contact investigations around them, we will continue to identify the close contacts who are at highest risk of becoming ill. As case counts increase, that may not be feasible to identify every single case that's reported and conduct a contact investigation around them to find every single contact. Our focus moves to containment at the community level to advise individuals to take precautions if they happen to know that they've been in contact with someone to take those measures that, that we've advised to monitor for symptoms. So um, as we expect cases to increase, it may not be feasible for, um, for the opportunity to investigate each face-to-face -face contact of every single case. Dr. Next question. Dr. Next question. Does, DHEC, does DHEC have any modeling that they're basing, uh, looking at? Are they basing any projections on, at this point? What are we looking at? Because everyone just sees the national picture, they see these bigger cities. What can we talk about what we're seeing right here in South Carolina, what you might be projecting? Well, the CDC has a task force that is doing modeling uh, for uh, looking at a number of variables, including how transmissible the virus is, um, the expectation of spread based on the, the uh, potential number of contacts. They are looking at the possibility of spread from people who do not yet have symptoms or the, the, um, the exact duration of, of shedding. So uh, those, those are being modeled by the CDC and we're monitoring that. We're basing a lot of our measures on what we know from other coronaviruses that are genetically similar to this one uh, from our understanding of what, what works in preventing the spread of disease in communities. Governor, we, uh, mass. we thank you very much for your time and attention. As you, we know these measures are going to be inconvenient for a lot of our people, but it is better to be safe than sorry, and that's our plan, and we will continue with that plan. Thank you.